whether you have the opener or you have six guys in the rotation or five, and they only it all begins and ends with starting pitching. And if you don't have it, I like like Warren said, your your bullpen is wore down and the season's done. You have got to be able to keep a healthy rotation to contend. And to me, if you have to go get extra guys at the All Star, you know, past the All Star break of the trade deadline, you got to do it. Well, not only that, I mean, as the Phillies drop tonight, 8-5, to five, I mean, I think the other thing is you bring the pitch in, but the bats just got to get around. Now, Schwarber starts to get hot around this time. He had a slow start. Harper's come back now and quicker than anybody after, a, you know, a Tommy John surgery there. So that's, that's got to be uh, good. He lost Reese Hopkins for the year. But the guy that's been the surprise there, and, and, they, and, and boy, and, and Warren, you played there in Philadelphia. They will let you have it. And I'm surprised Trey Turner is getting booed this early. We're not yeah. only about six weeks into the eight weeks into the season, and the dude is getting booed. I mean, yeah. uh, how tough is that? But, he, you know, he provided a home run, so that quickly went to clapping. But that's got to be tough as a, as a player coming into a new city like that. Right, yeah, that's very true. I'm sure he's putting pressure, you know. Uh, I've seen that in the past where guys sign big contracts and they put all sorts of pressure on themselves and, and fail to produce, and then it kind of snowballs on them. Uh, I saw a stat the other day. He played 44 games and had four home runs. He had more home runs in the six games in the World Baseball Classic, and he had more RBIs and more home runs in the six games he played in the World Baseball Classic than he does right now after 44 games. So he's, you know, gotten off to a tough start, and I'm sure he's putting all sorts of pressure on himself, you know, thinking that he's got to carry the team, especially with Harper being out of the lineup. Uh, but Cassianos has come back good. He's he's had a good year so far. So they, they've got the, the pieces, you know. It, been hurt, and it really hurt when they lost Reese Hoskins. He was kind of the consistent guy in their lineup that uh, they could depend on his – 25, 30 home runs, and he's going to drive in 100 runs, and he's going to hit 280. So he's off on base, and uh, they, of course, they're really going to miss his bat. They have so far. You know, you yeah. look at Philly's lineup. I mean, they've got a lot of pop, and you know, it starts. I mean, it starts with Alec Baum at first base. I mean, what six homers and 30 something. Uh, 30-something RBIs. I mean, that's an outstanding start. Um, Warren, what, what do you, why has he been so successful early on? Well, I think he's developed into a pretty good hitter. You know, he's he's finally figured it out. He's struggled and he's had some tough times. But I think uh, about the middle of last year, he started to figure it out. And all of a sudden, he hit 280, 290 last year. He, he had a real good season. And I think he's just picking up where he left off from last year. Mark, you know, you look at the Phillies at the leadoff spot, Bryson Stott, this is uh, a kid that um, I'm impressed with. I mean, you're hitting towards 300. Um, you know, that's really good. He, what, he played in what, uh, how many games for the Phillies last year? About 127. He got a good-sized sample of bats. Um, you know, he only hit 234. He had some pop. But right now he has some pop at about 195 bats coming into the night. Right. What he had five, he's got five homers. He's hitting about 290. Um, you know he can take a base. He's not uh, striking out a ton by today's standards. He is striking out. They all do, but by today's standards, he's not striking out very much. He's a guy that's putting the ball in play, and it all starts at the leadoff. Well, not only that, uh, we got Matt coming in, said the Phillies wasted 11-hit night tonight. The offense came ready to play. The pitching staff did not. Another game they've given away. And uh, I know that the Philly fans are coming out. Thank goodness the Phillies have a chance to do the right thing and not give Aaron Nola a $200 million contract after this year. I think that's unfair. I think Aaron Nola is a great And, and Warren and, and, and Todd, you know this. A lot of people think, for some reason, and we saw this in 2019 with the Washington Nationals, who were buried in May, came storming back, and then got into the playoffs, and took out the Dodgers, and, and, and you know, and, and, and ruled the Astros. So I don't know why the panic button is gone. We haven't even hit Memorial Day, and people are coming out and 
this guy doesn't deserve this and another wasted effort. You're going to have peaks and valleys here, guys. Any thought to that? All right. Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's teams that are really struggling. They're, like they're the Cardinals. There's a playoff team from last year that really got off to a bad start. And and uh, they're starting to turn it around, and it just it takes time. You know, you can't uh, judge the, the your whole season by the first six, eight weeks of the season. You know, they get into June. And uh, you start playing every day, and, and you know you, you get a little momentum, and, and things can change in a hurry. You know, so that's what you got to just keep going, and uh, just hope for the best, and hope they get the pitching straightened out, and, and get on a little bit of a roll. Well, also you got to remember, guys, they were without Bryce Harper. I mean, think about it. That's your best hitter. Um, you know, he makes a huge difference on the lineup, even if he's only the designated hitter and he's not playing the field. Um, this is a guy that's an MVP-type player that can carry you in the middle of the order, and they've only had him for so many games this year. I mean, you know, that that hurts. He's only played in 19 games thus far. So, and he's, what, hitting, you know, 19, 20 games, and he's hitting over 300. So he's doing his job, and... And hopefully he'll be able to play the field in the future. But any time you take a big middle of the bat out of your lineup, you know, I think the Phillies, like I said, hit the ball have done well. To me, it's all about pitching, and it will continue to be, especially if they're going to keep up with Lana, who's had some pitching injuries themselves. Three of their starting five are not in there right now, and they've managed to still stay in first place because they have this deep, deep farm system and a pretty darn good bullpen um, in their lineup one through nine, despite Ozuna's issues, all of a sudden he's catching fire. This is a team that is a World Series contender, and they're right in your division. <laughs> all right. Plus they lost their shortstop. Their shortstop's playing in Chicago yeah. now. And, and yeah, you know, so they've, they've gone through a lot. <laughs> Speaking of shortstop, Arcia uh, is having a career year for Atlanta. They've got two kids uh, named Shoemate and Grissom, and Grissom, Marquise Gr- or, uh, or uh, Grissom, as you guys know, uh, was the big kid who came up last year, hit a, you know, hit a home run in his first game at Fenway Park, and he took off and he beat him out because of uh, defense, which they preach here in Atlanta, uh, especially up the middle. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. They were. They could afford to let uh, Dan's and Swanson go. You know, that's that's not yeah. a, not a lot of. Teams. I mean, the Dodgers are one team. They've uh, overcome that, uh, the loss of Trey Turner, and uh, it's been kind of a revolving door with the Dodgers at shortstop. Uh, but they've still continued to win. You know, that's a good point, Warren. And before I bring that, another guy saying, "Man, that Phillies Met series is going to be a real." Resistible force versus movable object series. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. They, neither team have been very consistent. I yeah. mean, the Mets are just, they're, you know, they've been right around 500. They win four or five in a row, and then they lose three or four in a row. It's, yeah. it's, they've been really consistent. Again, let, let me ask you about team. You guys are talking about the Dodgers, and, you know, I don't think anybody had them to do this good with all the faces that have been moved in the last three years, especially this past year, losing Turner, right. Bellinger, the uh, the other Turner. Uh, guys have left, uh, and we thought, you know, the wheels would definitely fall off the Hollywood this year. They haven't quite yet. But when you look at the Padres, people look at talent, and I'm looking at trying to get all that chemistry on the same. When was the last time you've seen – Teams loaded like this end up tearing it apart in, 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 in any sport. We saw it in basketball when LeBron first went to Miami. We've seen it with the old Laker teams when they brought in Payton and Malone. We've seen this. When teams start to bring these kind of guys, it takes a little while to gel. Um, I think chemistry is more important than the talent level. Okay? Right, right. Because they, there's no question. I, it's just confusing. I mean, it's just it's hard to understand how the Padres continue to struggle. They just can't ever get anything consistent. You know, they've got a good pitching staff, they've got a good bullpen, and they have a solid everyday uh, nine players that they run out there, and it just in the five or six games below 500 just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It just doesn't add up. Yeah, 
So there's got to be something wrong in that clubhouse. Well, they, they're not pitching. I mean, it's the same thing as Philadelphia. They're not pitching. Right. Um, yeah, they're not. And, and, and this is a team game. You can have a team full of all-stars, and if you can't play collectively well as a group, it doesn't matter. I remember the Yankees back in the late 90s and early 2000s. They had the Paul O'Neills, the Bernie uh, Williams. They didn't have – all these superstars, they just saw, had all these very good players and the clutch player from Derek Jeter and this and that, and then they brought in all the superstars, and there went their championships for, for several years, according to Yankee standards. They didn't win one for a good 10 years later. So, um, you know, this is the team game, and, and it's about uh, coming together in the clubhouse. You have all these individual superstars. It doesn't mean anything on the field. It's it, it's right. all one. It's not one on paper. Right. <laughs> right. Well, that's that's the thing when you look at it, and and that's the sad part about it is they are loaded with talent down there, and they're within striking distance. But the real surprise when you look at some of these divisions is what's going on in the American League East. That's a flat-out war, except the Red yeah. Sox just got swept in Anaheim after taking two out of three in San Diego. So maybe the Angels are getting hot at the right moment. Yeah, yeah, that's another team that it, it, it bewilders you that they, they struggle because they've had a lot, last year they had a lot of injuries and they're still short on pitching, and now they they have shored up their pitching a little bit. Yeah, and they're they're trying to make a run. Yeah, they they've got a lot of talent there. You know, there's such a contrast in the American League. Well, the American League East is the best division in baseball. Everyone's above 500. It's really not even close. I mean, the AL West has got three teams over, or actually, they have four teams in the AL West over 500. I'm a Tigers guy, and thank God they're in the Central because they're only one <laughs> game out of first place in the loss column, and they're 23 and 25. Better, it's better to be uh, lucky than good. Right. And they really struggled to start. They were they were by ten and twenty four. They really struggled. They they played really well the last two or three weeks. They they've got close back to five hundred. Warren, you, you know you played for a great manager in in, in, in Dallas Green, and uh, you know Detroit's manager. I mean, this guy's won the World Series. Um, you know, with uh, with Houston. I think he's done a magnificent job when you look at the at look at this roster and the Tigers are only uh you know AJ Hintz has just been spectacular. I thought this team would be buried by now. Right, right. They got off to a real slow start and now they've turned it around and I mean AJ Hintz is he had Houston when they were young and you know, taught them at a young age how to win and now they would have been a dominant team in the American League for the last eight or ten years. And where they had one year where they lost hundred and ten games and he took them to turn it everything around. They had a lot of talent in the organization. Uh they made a couple bad moves with their draft or early draft hits, but for the most part they've done a real good job of uh drafting and developing players. And now they're a consistent team. They're they're you're in, you're out now. They they won and they're fighting for a World Series every year. You know, this is amazing when you look at the standings, gentlemen. Who would have thunk it was Tampa Bay, Minnesota, and Texas in the American League? Okay, I'll give you Atlanta in the AL. We weren't sure about Milwaukee. And the Dodgers, look, I thought they would be good. Uh, Mark, you did not. You thought it would be San Diego. Arizona's a surprise. St. Louis is near last. Boston and Toronto are in last. The Yankees are in the middle of the pack. Houston's in second place. What the heck is going on, Warren and, and Mark, in, in, in baseball this year? Surprise, surprise. Right. Well, you take a team like Texas that, again, they were short on pitching, short up their pitching, and then got Bruce Bochy as their manager. And, <laughs> you know, proven time and time again, he knows how to push the right buttons. And I think Texas is a team that's going to be reckoned with. Yeah, they're going to. It's going to be a fight between them and Houston all the way. And you throw California in there, and, and there are the LA Angels. And uh, another team that's surprising is Seattle. They've they've struggled to start with. They're just right around 500. Uh, so that American League West is going to be a good race. Now they they've got all the, all four of the five teams are are contender 
uh, to win the division. It's going to come down to the last couple of weeks of the season, you know, and that's and the American League East the same way. That's an awesome division, and the Central is going to be. <laughs> It's just they're going to – one team's going to be around 500 to win the division. Hey, the Twins did it in 87, spoiled by Tigers, stuck around 500 and ended up winning the whole thing. So we know with the Phillies it's a crapshoot. You saw it last year, and then you saw the year before with Atlanta. I guess the key now is just get in, Mark. Just get in. Well, well here's the thing. And, you know, a lot of people can say what they want. The pronosticators that haven't played the game – had the Pirates winning 66 games this year. The Pirates are going to shatter that. But here's the other thing. When you follow a team uh, and you see these guys on a yearly basis, and Warren can, you know, chime in along with you, Todd, you know, you start, you have to lay the foundation down. And when you look at somebody like the Pirates, yeah, you take your lumps. You've got to lose to win. And people might not realize that. You just don't win without losing first. What the Pirates did this year is they brought veteran leadership in there to teach these kids, the, the, the Andrew McCutcheons, the, the, the Rich Hills, guys you can, you know, pick their brains and, and, and absorb it. G-Man Choi's, Carlos Santana's, Connor Joe's. And, you know, this is, this is what they've done to go along with these guys. There's injuries there with the O'Neill Cruz, you know, but look at the Pirates. They, they could have gave up on Mitch Keller Last year when he was struggling, they stuck with him. The dude's a Cy Young candidate right now. So yeah. I'm, when you look at this team, this team is 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 is, is going to take their lumps. They're 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 winning the games they didn't win last year, and they're playing on house money. And they got the number one pick two of the last three years. And this year, if they get that kid out of LSU, and well, you you know you guys can chime in on this. That guy's a five tool player, man. Right. Right. Yeah, they they say he's the closest to being in the big leagues right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they, they turned it around. Chelsea's done a great job. You know, it's a, again, the organization standing pat with what they've got and continue to work and get better and uh, believe in the people that they've hired to turn that thing around. And now they've, they're starting to see the fruits of that labor turning it around, and uh, now they're going to contend to be a playoff team. You're listening to Philadelphia Phillies alumni, uh, alumni podcast with 1980 World Series champion Warren Brewster, who won it with the Phillies, and the great players like Mike Schmidt and Pete Rose and et cetera, Bob Boone, Larry Boa. And, and guys, we got about, what, uh, uh, just under eight minutes left in the show. Let's talk about the new rules. I want Warren to go first. I'll go last. Mark, you go second. Two part question, everyone. We got about two minutes apiece on each one. What do you think of the rule changes, and what impact do you see on the game thus far? Go ahead, Warren. Well, the biggest thing is the pitch clock. You know, they they made <laughs> they made the guys go to work and and uh, not take so much time to make the game get along. I mean, they've shortened the game twenty five to thirty minutes. You know, so it's it's a lot different game and it's a lot quicker and it's a lot more exciting for the fans. Yeah. I think that's the, the biggest change, you know, but there are some times where uh, Cody Bellinger comes back to LA, gets a standing ovation and they call strike one on him because he took too long. You know, that's just, it's got to be some common sense used, you know, in situations like that, when their uh, guy's getting a standing ovation, it's not his fault for, for running the clock out, you know, it's, it's just common sense, you know, and then, and now the hitter has to look at the pitcher and there's, there's little nuances to the game that, that are, you know, that, that are, they're going to have to tweak a little bit, but I, you know, as far as anything, the pitch clock, I think to me is the best thing. And the kids coming up out of the minor leagues now are used to it because they've had the pitch clock in the minor leagues for two or three years now. Bases are concerned, the bigger bases, I haven't really noticed that much of a difference. Uh, as far as guys being safe at first on bang bang plays, or, or guys sliding into second, you know, hopefully it's a little easier for them to stay on the bag and hold the bag. You know, the, the bigger bases are not as high. I think they're a little flatter, and guys don't, uh, especially when it's wet and, and raining. Uh, guys have had a tendency in the past to slip and fall on the bags and, and things like that and cause injuries. So, 
hopefully that will uh, lessen the injuries, you know. Now, and, Warren, and you, other... do you like the pitch clock, and would have you liked it when yeah. you pitched? Oh, yeah, I would have. I, you know, cause it wouldn't have affected me at all. I got the ball and got a sign and went. I, I wanted to work as fast as I could. You know, for me, I didn't want to think. I wanted to just react. You know, baseball is a game of reaction. You, you start thinking, you think too long, you think wrong. So I wanted to get the ball and go. I got my sign from the catcher and went, unless it was something that I couldn't, that I couldn't do. There were times where a catcher I didn't, I wasn't used to him, and he gave me a sign that I don't throw that pitch. I don't have that pitch in my arsenal. Sorry. <laughs> you know, little things like that. There'd be nuances like that. But at the end of the inning, I have to go in and explain my. This is what I have, and this is what we're going to work with. Mark. Yeah. And you know, but my my thought on that, Todd, is is uh, I gotta agree with Warren. You know, if 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 I'm a pitcher in today's game, I'm a little disappointed because I can't quick pitch the hitters, and that's what I would like to do is quick pitch them. They don't let you do that. They don't let you put you know pitch uh, high and tight inside because you you know I I guess what I'm trying to say is back then. Uh, Warren, you could you could you know police your own game. These guys today can't right. do that. The umpires right. are basically taken out of their hands. You you know if a guy hits a home run off of you and takes a half an hour to walk around the bases, the next guy up is going to get drilled, and you can't do right. that. Otherwise, you know they, they they take that out of your hands. There's bench warnings and all this stuff. So I think that's where, you know, it, it's it's more for the hitter than it is the pitcher in some ways. Am I right? Oh, yeah. I, I Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Yeah. And, it, you know, and, it, and that's the way the game's gotten. I mean, last year, hitting-wise, was was ridiculous. It, I, they, they had, I think they hit 235 or 240 as an entire Major League Baseball. They, nobody hit 300. You know, you didn't see hardly any offense. The only offense you saw were home runs. And I think this way, you know, they've taken the shift away. I think that has increased. It's given the left-handed hitters a lot more fair and uh, a better chance to hit and be successful hitting. When they loaded up everybody on the right side of the infield and the outfield, the guys, the left four left-handed hitters didn't have a chance. There weren't any holes for them to hit the ball through. You know, you either had to hit it right through the defense at 110 miles an hour or you were out. You know, and it's it's a short throw to anywhere in short right field to first base. You know, so it was uh, yeah, it really affected the left-handed hitters, and I'm glad to see it it evening out and um, and a lot more offense in the game. You know, even as a pitcher, I still have to go to the ballpark and see offense. I mean, that's what's going to put people in the seats. Hey, you know, guys, I'm going to kind of take the opposite of this a little bit, if you don't mind. I'm I'm as old school as it gets. I don't like the pitch clock. I see it's leading to more injuries for pitchers who are not used to it. Um, get baseball is a thinking man's game. Sometimes you need to be able to think a little bit what pitch you're going to throw in what situation. I don't have a problem with a game being three hours, as long as the pace is good. You can have a great three-hour game with fantastic pace and a lousy two-hour game with slow pace. You know, getting the ball and going is great, but to me, the game has never been played with a clock in over 100 years, and now we're doing it. You're running the perfect configuration of an infield. You're allowing the stolen base numbers to get fudged compared to where B. Ricky Henderson would have 200 in these rules today, not being able to throw over more than two times a third time. you got to get them out. Um, I don't like the runner on second in extra base innings with a last batter out and a runner on second. It reminds me of softball. Um, I don't like the I, – I just – you know, I don't like the stuff. I, I'm glad they got rid of the shift. I am glad for that, but um, you know, look, my thing is, and I know we got to go. We got less than a minute. If you want to change it, the umpires can get the players in the box and get them to go and stop fidgeting around. Two, you can raise them out slightly. Three, move the fences back. You'll see more balls put in play because guys aren't going to be swinging for the fence. Nobody is a defensive two-strike hitter anymore. So that would be my way to change him. We only got about, what, 30 seconds left, Mark? 
Yeah, Kenneth from Peoria, Arizona says it's nice everybody's talking Pirates, Braves, and Phillies. Uh, we'll oh, see you all it. in the playoffs when my Arizona Diamondbacks win the division. You know what? That's possible. I'm not going to sit here and rule that out. That's for sure. Um, you yeah, know, we they got, got a lot of young talent there. They yeah. sure do, and that, that was my sleeper pick. Gosh, we got to go. The show's almost over. Um, Warren, thanks. It's so great hearing your voice. I can't wait. We're going to be on every week here live on Blog Talk Radio. I'll replay the show on Twitter. And, uh, you know, thanks for uh, doing this, Mark. Or, uh, Warren and Mark, thank you for making it all happen. And it's been yep. a privilege, gentlemen. Well, guys, how do they get a hold of you? If they want to get a hold of you, which I think they'll want to get a hold of you. Real quick, Warren. Uh, I can be reached at Brewster40, B-R-U-S-S-T-A-R 40, at gmail.com. You can get me at Quarter Todd on Twitter. And, Mark, you can get you at Mancini Sports on Twitter also. Yes, and what a game to, today. We'll talk about it next week for Warren Brewster out there in Napa, California. Todd Quarter out there in Atlanta, Georgia. Yours truly, Mark Mancini in Los Angeles. We'll talk to you next week. Tell all your friends about it. Thanks for tuning in to the Philadelphia Phillies Alumni Podcast. Have a great night.